Hello, welcome back to the NA Podcast. I am Ashley, and today we are going to be continuing our Bible books overview series. Um, we're still in the Pentateuch. We've gone through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and now we're on to Numbers. If you haven't seen those other videos, I'd recommend going back and checking those out before watching this video. But without further ado, I'm just going to jump into it, starting off with a brief overview of numbers. So as you might recall, the book of Leviticus ends with the creation of the tabernacle, which is where um, it's a traveling structure where God's presence will dwell within the nation or within uh, the tribes as they travel into the promised land. This takes place near Mount Sinai and uh, numbers kind of picks up there when they start to travel. The book chronicles Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness before entering the promised land. And um, Numbers gets its name because a census is taken of the people of Israel near the beginning of the book. Uh, the book outlines stipulations as to where the tribes of Israel would dwell around the tabernacle as they continue their journey. And as the story goes on, the people complain, but God remains faithful, and they inch closer to the promised land. So as I said, this kind of chronicles the 40-year um journey in the desert and things go so bad during this time uh it gets to the point where the israelites are like so mad that they're even in the desert that they're trying to formulate this plan to like bring up this new leader and hijack it back to egypt because they're so over it um and god is pretty mad about this which is understandable he's promised these people this promised land the land of canaan and they're like no we do not like it here i can't believe you brought us out of slavery for this we're getting out anyway god's pretty upset and um, moses intercedes on behalf of the people and god tells them that he'll give them what they want he tells them that they won't go to the promised land in fact he tells them that they will die in the wilderness um and only their children will inherit the land that he's promised so they wandered for 40 years because um some spies were sent into the land of Canaan and they came back and then only two of the ten, so Caleb and Joshua, were like, ah, oh, we're not going in there. We're going to get eaten alive by the giants, um, even though God like promised us this land or whatever. And so God, again, is like, fine, now you're going to wander for 40 years. And this is when he's like, and none of you are going to inherit it except for Caleb and Joshua because you guys are idiots. <laughs> Understandably so. Um, even Moses isn't going to enter into the promised land and we'll see why in a minute. Another rebellion after all these things comes about and God literally opens up the earth to swallow them. The people that rebelled. Yeah, the people continue to complain and rebel and more things happen. Um, the book kind of wraps up with a census of the new generation. Uh, Israel winning sev several battles and some tribes beginning to even kind of settle in the promised land. So here are some stories that you might uh, know from the book of Numbers. The Israelites complaining in the wilderness about being hungry and thirsty. So they're walking in the wilderness, and like I said, they're complaining, and they're like, ugh, I can't believe you brought us out of Egypt uh, from slave. Like, it'd be better to be slaves than in this desert hungry. So basically, they wanted to go back to, into slavery. They wanted to go from freedom back into slavery because they would have food. But God is gracious and kind, and he provides for them every morning manna and quail from the sky. He literally sends them down food. But do you think this satisfies them? No, it doesn't because they start complaining about that too. Um, but anyway, that's one you might be familiar with. Like I briefly mentioned, um, to investigate the land of Canaan, the promised land, God sends 12 sp or, uh, Moses sends 12 spies into the land to kind of check it out, and they see these huge people. And so these 12 men come back. It's been 40 days that they spent, and they come back, and they're like, we can't go in there. Like, this is awful. This is terrifying. We're going to get eaten alive by these these monsters. But Caleb and Joshua are like, no, we, like, we'll go in there. And, like, it's fine, whatever. And so, again, God is like, well, now you're going to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. Like, you're not getting here during this book <laughs> um, because of your rebellion and not trusting me. This is what's going to happen. And so he's like, Caleb and Joshua, Joshua, you'll get to go into the promised land, but the rest of you, you won't. And so that is one. Um, so along with complaining about being hungry, they complain about being thirsty. And again, they're like literally rising up and Moses is like, oh my gosh. And so the first time this happens, God tells Moses to strike a rock and he does and water flows from it. And it happens again and God tells Moses to speak to the rock, but he doesn't. He hits the, he hits the rock again. And this is going against God. Um, 
he goes against God's direct commandment, and because of that, Moses is told he will not inherit the promised land. He will die before they get to the promised land, which sucks. Um, Moses did all these things, but this goes to show you how much God cares about sin. This one thing separated him from this promised land, and our, just like our sins separate us from God. All right, and let's, oh, here's another fun one, Balaam's donkey. So um, the king of Moab hires a Canaan uh, sorcerer to, like, curse the land, of, like the Israelites, but he, the sorcerer can't, Balaam can't. Uh, he can only give blessings. And there's this whole, like, whole thing that happens where God uses a donkey to speak to Balaam. Like, the donkey's literally physically talking to Balaam because Balaam's, like, beating it, and the donkey's like, what, what are you, what's going on? And so um, there's... If you ever hear people say, like, God used the mouth of a donkey to speak to people, God can use me too. That's where that comes from. Um, yeah. So that's just some stories that you might be familiar with. I feel like I'm butchering this. I'm so sorry. One key Bible verse is uh, widely known as a benediction or the benediction. It comes from Numbers 6, 24 through 26. And this says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Now, this is something that um, is used, sorry, uh, this is something that's used usually at the end of church services or you see it maybe in people's houses, but it's actually very beautiful. If you think about the Israelites, how much they rebelled, how much they sinned, how much they fell short of the glory of God, this is, this is the blessing that God gives to them. Despite their rebellion, God is faithful, and I think this is really highlighted in these verses especially because just how rebellious they are in numbers and really the rest of the Bible. So how does this book point to Jesus? Well, um, I mentioned Joshua before, and Joshua, uh, it was one of the, the spies that were sent into the land of Canaan, and he was one of the two, Caleb and Joshua, that came out and were like, uh, were faithful to God. So the name Joshua actually is Jesus' name. So Joshua is Yeshua, um, Jesus is Yeshua. And so there's a lot of similarities because Joshua is the one that will ultimately lead them into the promised land. Jesus, um, in a similar vein, is the one that leads us to salvation, to the promised land of um, peace, with, peace with God, which is really cool. There's a bunch of similarities that overlap with those two, but that's just kind of one, um, one way that it points to Jesus through Joshua. Oh, one story that I didn't mention is... Um, so the Israelites are complaining, 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 and are being really wicked. And so God sends this plague of snakes to bite them. And they're venomous snakes. And he tells them that the only cure is going to be um, to construct this this uh, this pole with a snake on it. And it's all going to be bronze. And they're going to they're gonna hold that uh, stake with the snake on it. And the people are going to look up to the bronze snake. And this is what's going to heal them. Now... It's kind of funky, like it kind of kind of seems funky that looking at this snake will heal their illness. It's a really cool overlap to our to our sin and what saves us. So uh, think of well, the snake kind of points us back to the fall of mankind, where Adam and Eve uh, eat the forbidden fruit, the snakes in the garden, and whatnot. And so these people then in numbers are getting bit by these snakes and they're getting poisoned. And just like their physical poison is killing them, our sin is killing us too. Our sin is poison. But what's the cure? Looking at Jesus on the cross. Looking to Jesus as our only our only hope and our only cure. He is the cure, the antidote for this sickness. It, there's no other way to cure it. And so that's just kind of a kind of a fun thing. So where does Numbers end? Numbers kind of ends uh, basically with some tribes kind of setting up. Um, in the promised land and it kind of just like gives an overview of uh, or like some stipulations on where people are going to live and like uh, the boundaries of Canaan and those types of things so ju that's just kind of how it ends um, yeah I feel like I always end these so abruptly <laughs> I, I need to do better at transitioning but anyway I hope that you enjoyed this video I hope it made a little bit of sense I feel like I was all over the place I'm very scatterbrained today I don't know why Anyway, tune in next time to hear about the fifth and final book of the Pentateuch. Talk to you later.